bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Oh, that was beautiful. Bless this house. Amen. Amen. We're kicking off our new series and I believe it's going to be such a blessing to so many of us. Amen. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you. God, that we can lean into your word. Thank you that you are here in the midst. God, that you are here in our hearts. Holy Spirit, that you are speaking to us. And God, I just pray that you would just, um, yeah, speak to us today. God, may you have your will in our lives. Have your will in this place in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Good to be here, hey. Oh, I love church. So bless this house. Um, what would you use if you were to describe your home or your house? And I don't mean your physical house, but your home, your family, or those that make up your, your core family. What words would you use to describe that? I hope that you would say, yes, my family is blessed. My house is blessed. But for some of us, that may not be the first word that comes to mind. I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm going to go, if I'm thinking about my house or my home, my family... Maybe a word more like chaos would be an appropriate word, <laughs> yeah? Or a word like crazy might be the right word or, you know, our house is full of joy and love and peace and all those kinds of things, but gosh, sometimes the word I would use is frustrating or exhausting. Some of those night times with kids, it's just like a revolving door. One comes in, the next one, and it's just like, guys, everyone just sleep, please, <laughs> So there's probably lots of words that we could like pull out and say, yeah, that's how I would describe my home. But I'm praying as we go on this series, we could begin to identify how God wants to bless us and he wants to bless families. Did you know families are so important to God? Families are so important. It is, it's God's design um, as we get married and as we have families. And, and whether you're married or single, whether you've got kids or you don't have kids, maybe you're a blended family or an adopted family or maybe you're self-appointed into a family, that's okay too. Whatever your family looks like, I want you to know that God loves your family and it's by his design that he's placed you where he has you. And so families are so important to God. And so our prayer is that we could learn and grow as individuals as we go through this series and recognize how God wants to bless us. And if you're sitting here thinking, you know, I don't have a family, so this isn't going to apply to me. I just want to one more time just say, hey, these principles will apply across many areas of your life. So if you're not someone that's, you're sitting here and you go, I don't have a family, but you're, you, maybe you run a business or maybe you um, are in a workplace, maybe you're in a school or a university or somewhere, these same principles will apply if you want to walk in blessing and favour in whatever sphere of, your, sphere of life you're in right now. But all of us belong to a family and so we can all identify with this. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, and in Matthew chapter 5, we see a list of, of statements of blessing that Jesus uses, that he speaks, and uh, we'd know these as the Beatitudes. Many of us would know these, and so these are these statements of blessing that Jesus gives us, and he says, hey, if you live according to this, blessed are those, blessed are those, and he gives us these statements of blessing, so if you live this way, you will be blessed. You can count on it that you will walk in blessing as you live your life according to the principles and, and, and the ways that God has um, laid out in his word. So God gives us really clear pathways to walk in blessing. Because, you know, there's some trains of thought out there and some teaching even in churches where they talk about you can't, you can't demand a blessing from God. And I totally agree with that. You know, God's not a genie that we can just rub him on the right angle and he'll appear and he'll make our, our, our dreams and our wishes come true. That's not the kind of God we serve. He's not a genie. But I certainly do believe that he gives us really clear pathways and he makes it really simple for us. He says, hey, walk this way, do these things, live by these principles, and you can be sure that you will be blessed. And so I totally believe in, in living a life where we can say, you know, God, bless this house. God, bless this home. Bless our marriage. Bless 
our family. You can see it through the Old Testament. These men and these women, these faithful men and women who served God and who, who stood for God and who stood firm in their faith. And it says that they found favor in the eyes of the Lord, that God blessed and God blessed Abraham. He blessed Daniel and, and Mary found favor in the sight of God. So I totally don't believe this is incorrect teaching at all. We can expect and believe for blessing and favor from God. Yeah? I love it in um, Psalm 112 verse 1 and 2. And it says this. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Their children will be successful. Come on, is there an amen in this place today? Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. I love that scripture. I want to to blow it up real big over my home. A generation of godly people will be blessed. It starts with us. It starts with myself and my husband. Wherever you're at, wherever you're at you're in your sphere of life, it starts with you. And a generation of godly people can be blessed by us making a decision to fear God and obey His commands, to live according to the way that He's called us to live. Yeah? Lord, bless this house. It's less about us saying, God, you must bless me. And it's more about us saying, God, I know that if I follow you, you will, I will be blessed. There is no doubt about it. Amen? Amen. So we're going to look at a few of these, these passages or these verses over the next few weeks as we un- unroll this series. But, and the first one is found in verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We've got to to look at this verse and look at the order in which it's been said and look at the role that we are to carry. See, our role in this verse, what is our role? To hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then what does God do? He fills us. Yeah. See, too often in life, and I'm guilty of this myself, too often we're trying to do the filling. Yeah? Yeah? We're trying to fill our lives with things that make us feel good, that things, things that make us happy or things that make us feel like we're successful, material things or relationships, whatever. We're trying to fill our lives. And God says, no, 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 I'll fill your life. You seek and, and search me and hunger for, and thirst for, uh, for my kingdom and for my righteousness and I will do the filling. Too often we've got this the wrong way around and we're searching after things, trying to fill our lives. God's saying, hey, no, no, seek after me. We know the verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And then what? All these things will be added unto you. Hey, God's saying, put me first. Seek after me because I know what will fill your life. I know what will actually cause you to live a life that is satisfied, that is, that is life and life more abundant, that is life overflowing, where you will experience joy and peace and excitement and goodness and favour from God. I know what it is, so just seek after me. Pursue me with all your heart. Search for me and I will fill you and you will be blessed. Amen? I love in the New Testament, we can see this really clearly in the story of Simon Peter and and Jesus. And Jesus is preaching to the multitudes and the disciples are there and in, in Luke chapter five, 5, you'll find this story and Jesus is preaching, but the crowd is growing and he can't project his voice enough. So he, he asks Peter for his boat and Peter gives Jesus his boat so that he can push it off to the shore so that he can continue preaching to the crowds. So the first thing is that G, uh, Peter surrenders his boat for kingdom purpose. He says, God, yeah, yeah, you can have my boat. You can use my life, my resource. Everything that I have is tied up in this boat. You can have it. And then what happens after he's preaching, Jesus says to Peter, we're going to take this boat out to the deep and we're going to catch the greatest haul of fish. And Peter says, no, no, I've been fishing all night and we caught nothing. Jesus says, no, 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 let's take your boat now and let's go and see what we can find in the deep. And we know the story that they haul in the biggest catch of fish they've ever seen. Notice the sequence. Peter surrenders his boat to Jesus. Jesus, you can have this. I surrender it to you. My life is yours. My, my, what you've given me is yours. I give it to you for your purpose, for kingdom purpose, for ministry's sake. And then Jesus fills his boat. Yeah? What, I've got a question for us. What is it that we need to surrender to Jesus in order to allow him to fill it? I like this. That's good, eh? 
What do we need to surrender to? What is it, our, our marriage or our family or our homes or our, our business, our, our work, our ideas, what is it that we need to surrender to Jesus? Say, Jesus, use this for your kingdom purpose in order that Jesus would then fill it to overflowing, that you would haul in the biggest catch of fish that you've ever seen in your life. God wants to fill your life. He says, hey, give me your boat. Go, Jesus wants to fill your life, but he's saying, hey, give me your boat. Amen? So what does it mean? To hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? This is talking about appetite. An appetite. What's an appetite? It's a desire for what? For for righteousness, for God, for his kingdom. We've got a desire for God that there'd be this, this inner kind of longing and searching and appetite for the things of God. The question is, what do you have an appetite for? Because appetites are interesting, right? Appetites are interesting. I like to put it this way. Appetites are like toddlers. That's what appetites are. Appetites don't know what is good for them or what is not good for them. They just want more. That's how an appetite works. We give our toddler chocolate and what do they say? More. They don't know if it's good for them or bad for them. They just want more. That's how our appetites work. Appetites are dangerous. Toddlers are dangerous. Did you know toddlers are dangerous? Walking hazards. Have you ever tried to play catch with a toddler? Goodness me, you give them a tennis ball and because they can't throw real well and because they're small, you've got to stand close to them. So you like lob this little gentle past them that they miss and they pick it up, but you're standing so close and they've got these little tiny arms and it becomes this really short lever. And you'll cop one to your body. Toddlers are dangerous. Toddlers are dangerous to clean around. I was doing the vacuuming. This happened a couple of years ago. I was doing the vacuuming and because the vacuum makes noise, I was like, and I'm usually angry when I'm cleaning. That's what my husband says. He knows I'm angry when I'm cleaning the house. It's not true. Sometimes it's true. (laughs) So I'm vacuuming the carpet and it's got this, the vacuum's got this big tube and I'm vacuuming and because I can't hear the vacuum's making noise, my toddler's come up behind me. I didn't even know. And I flung him across the other side of the room because the tube caught him and threw him across was awesome but it's dangerous (laughs) toddlers are dangerous and our appetites are dangerous because they just want more and if we treat our appetite like our toddler that can just tell us what they want we're gonna find ourselves in all sorts of trouble no 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 we've got to be the parent to our appetite we are got to say, no, appetite, you've got to hunger for things that are good. You've got to long for things that are going to be beneficial to you, not things that are going to bring you harm and lead you down the bad, a wrong path. It's like if we just go into this a bit further, we know what sugar does to our bodies. There's lots of research around that, and many of us are sugar addicted. I'll put my hand up. We've got this sugar addiction, and so our body craves more. If we feed our body sugar, it craves more and more of it. and becomes this really dangerous cycle that even though we know it's not necessarily good for us, we want it. Yeah? We want more of it. But what we need to do, and if you've ever been on a health kick, you know that the first few days are hard, right? It's like wrangling a toddler. No, you cannot have any more chocolate. The first few days are hard. But you get through those first few days and your body begins to rewire. And you rewire your system and all of a sudden what you had an appetite for, the wrong thing, you can actually change and harness that appetite to hunger for the right thing. And your system changes and actually the way you think about eating and food actually changes. I experienced this last year. I went on a big health kick for about six months and then I lost it. It all fell apart. It was very depressing. Anyway... But what happens is you can actually change your appetite. You can tell your ab- don't let your appetite say what it wants. If I if I let my t- toddler decide what we're having for every meal, it's chocolate, chocolate for breakfast, chocolate for lunch, chocolate for dinner. I can't let my toddler decide what I'm going to eat. I've got to be the parent and say, no, this is what we're going to hunger and thirst for. That's how appetites work. Does that make sense? So whatever you are feeding on, you will desire more of. Whatever you're feeding on, you will desire more of. That's why sin sometimes can become so rampant in our lives. Because we get a taste for it, we get an appetite for it. And soon enough, we're longing for it and desiring for it. And it becomes this hold and this stronghold over our lives that we need the power of God to help us break it in Jesus' name. But not only that, we need the grace of God and his power, but we need to put in some disciplines. Say, no, 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 we are not going to eat chocolate for every meal. 
we're going to eat good things. It's the same spiritually. Yeah? We're going to hunger and long for and desire the things of God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So if we want to say, Lord, bless this house, what are some practical things that we can do as parents, as leaders, as uh, workers, as business owners, as students, wh- wherever we are, what are some practical things that we can do to say, God, bless me, bless my house, bless my marriage, bless my family, bless my business? Well, the first thing, the first thing I want to look at is a couple of things that don't work. Sometimes you've got to look at what doesn't work and then look at what does work, right? So the first thing that doesn't work is legalism. Legalistic Christianity, it doesn't work. I've, I've seen families and homes where it's become very, it's very legalistic and it's a list of rules and cans and can'ts and do's and don'ts and, and must and have not and will not and it just becomes suffocating and rigid and there's a lack of relationship. That's what legalism is. It's rules without relationship. There's a lack of relationship and they say rules without relationship equals rebellion. I was reading something this week and it was saying teenagers don't rebel against authority. They rebel against a lack of relationship. Teenagers don't rebel against authority. They rebel against a lack of relationship. So we've got to make sure we don't have legalistic homes, legalistic lives where it's this list of rules and you can't do that. We've got to, we've got to make sure we've got uh, room in our lives to have those godly conversations with people. Now, this is why, this is why we, we choose to live this way is because God says, hey, you live this way, you're going to be blessed. We have those conversations. And so it's less about legalism and more about inviting God into the conversation. The second thing that doesn't work is lukewarm Christianity. Legalistic Christianity doesn't work and lukewarm Christianity doesn't work. You know, lukewarmness means you believe in God, but you live like he doesn't exist. You believe in God, but your life says something completely different. Your life says he doesn't exist. And so do you know what that message sends to those around us in our homes, particularly parents with kids? Do you know what that message sends? It's confusing. It's confusing. And it's inconsistent. It's confusing and it's inconsistent. And therefore, it's uninspiring. It, it, it's, it's passionless. It's kind of like, meh, meh, bleh. Revelation talks about um, God spitting out of his mouth, yeah? You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm and I'll spit you out of my mouth. It, it, lukewarm Christianity doesn't work. Do you want to know what does work? Let's have a look at what does work. If legalistic Christianity doesn't work and lukewarm Christianity doesn't work, what does work is living Christ-centered. Christ-centered. You know, we have a saying in our home, we don't, we're not a Christian family, we are a Christ-centered family. We are a Christ-centered family. Christ is the head of our home. As much as Christ is the head of this church, Christ is the head of our home. And we base our life around Christ. Jesus is not on the periphery. God is not just an option on the air. Um, yeah, I'll consider it. God, no, no. God is the centre. He is our, our, our all, our everything. And as we place him at the centre of our lives, it's not us saying, you know, God, hopefully you'll fit into my plans. It's saying, no, God, you are the centre and I'm going to fit into whatever your plan is for my life. We make God the centre and we live our lives around making him the most important thing. He is our first and foremost priority in our family. God is the head of this home. Jesus is the head of this church. And I pray that you would carry that. Christ-centeredness into your homes and into your families and into your sphere of life. We are Christ-centered. But God is not just a part of our life, but he's everything. Psalm 63, we see the heart of David in this psalm and he says, God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. This is David saying, God, you are everything everything. God, I'm wholeheartedly seeking and after and pursuing you. I just long for you, for you, for your righteousness, for your kingdom, for your goodness, for your favour. I long for more of you, God. And in the same way in our families, as we lead our homes and lead our families, in the same way we hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, we want you to lead this family. God, we want you to help us make the decisions. Give us wisdom. Help us to know how to follow your your ways. Give us wisdom and and surround us with protection and peace. God, be our centre. Be our everything. I want to give us three things, three practical things that we can do to create a hunger 
or to harness our appetite, that we would have an appetite for the things of God in our families and in our homes, that we could hunger and thirst for righteousness. Three really practical things that help our, hap- our appetite in terms of the things of God. And the first thing is this. Talk about God daily. Talk about God daily. Talk about, whether you've got children or you don't have, whoever's in your world, whoever you're, talk about God daily. Make him a part of your conversations. Make him so normal that somebody that doesn't talk about God is so weird. Yeah? Make talking about God so normal. He is a, he's an everyday part of our life. We bring him up in conversations. We endeavour to do this in our home with our children is that we, most nights of the week, we sit down as a family, we have our meal and we begin to, we start it off with prayer. We honour God, we thank God, we pray. And then we talk about God. We ask each other how our day was and we ask what God's saying to you and what God's speaking to you. And we, we talk about verses and we talk about scripture. We make God part of our everyday conversations. I love it. We, you know, every night we pray with our kids. And at the moment, it's funny because I'll often pray. I'll pray all sorts of different things. But sometimes I'll go in and I'll say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And then in unison, we all go, ah. (laughs) It's funny. (laughs) Talk about God. Make him a part of your everyday conversations. Why? Because that stirs an appetite. It stirs an appetite for the things of God. I want to know more. Tell me more. Tell me about this God who is awesome that you continue to praise and that you continue to lift up. When you walk into your home, tell tell your family, tell your spouse, God has blessed us. How blessed are we? When you walk into your workplace, goodness me, how blessed are we? Look at all the great things that God has done for us, what He's given us and what we what, the way that we can live because of God. Talk about God and incorporate Him in your everyday conversations. That will stir more and more of an appetite for the things of God. I love it in our staff. Uh, I think we started this last year, but in our staff meetings, we have this little segment, which is like good stories. Tell us the good stories. We want to hear the good stories. What are you hearing in people's lives that God's doing? Because it stirs faith and it encourages us. We know that God's on the move, that God's stirring people's hearts, that he's blessing people, that he's, we're seeing healings and all sorts of things taking place. And it's so, so cool when we share these stories, it all stir, it stirs our faith. Yeah. So keep talking about God. The second thing is this, is make church a non-negotiable. Or if you want to put it another way, value church. Do you, know what, do, you, do you know what the thing is about church? Is that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. What is a bride to her groom? The most important thing. The most important thing. Did you know nothing else on this earth has a future except for the church? Nothing else has a future on this earth except for the church. The church is so important to Jesus. The church is his bride. And in the same way that he values his church, we also need to place value on the church of Jesus Christ and the body of believers and the gathering of the saints. Make church a non-negotiable. Church is important. I grew up in a home where I, I did not dare suggest that we would not go to church. It was not heard of. It was not, you know, I can remember with this one, this one time, I can't remember exactly how old I was. I must have been about seven or eight. My grandmother had myself, made myself and my two sisters these beautiful dresses. They weren't that beautiful, okay? <laughs> I'm sure they were lovely and I'm thankful for it, but I hated wearing dresses. I, I tell you, I, I was very much a tomboy, probably still am. I hated wearing dresses. So I said to my mum, I am not going to church because I did not want to wear the dress. And she said, you are coming to church and we're going to be in the car in five minutes. And if you're not in the car, then we're going to go to church and you're going to stay home. And I was like, good, I'm staying home then. And so I can hear them get in the car, there's doors shut. I can hear the garage go up. And I'm waiting in my bedroom, very well knowing that church is a non-negotiable. And sure enough, my mother storms down the hallway and she says, you will come to church. I will put you in this dress and I will put you in the car and you'll come into church whether you like it or whether you don't like it. But I was taught from a very young age how important church was. I was taught from a young age that church is something that is non-negotiable. It is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. 
And then as we gather together, something takes place in the gathering of the saints where our faith is stirred and we get to iron sharpen Zion, we get to talk to other believers and we're encouraged and we get to worship our great God and our perspective changes and we set our eyes on Jesus and we forget about the distractions and we're in the church. Mums and dads value church. Men and women, children value church. It's important. And in this season, I just want to talk into this space for a moment. Can we not let COVID be an excuse? I know I'm preaching to the choir right now because you're here. But can we not let COVID be an excuse for not going to church? If there is one place that we should be saying, you know what? I don't care what you say or what you make us do. I will be in the house of God regardless. My motto in this season, my motto is I love being in church more than I hate wearing a mask. That is my motto because I don't like wearing a mask either. But I love being in church more than I hate wearing it because it's important to me and I value it. And if we can't gather, there are our campuses across Sydney that cannot gather right now, but they're gathered online. Praise God for technology that we live in this season, that even though we can't gather physically, we can gather online. Churches, families, I want to encourage you, make uh, people, families, make church a priority. Value it. It is the house of God. It is the bride of Christ. The last thing is this. Make it fun. You want to hunger and thirst for something? You will desire more of what you enjoy. <laughs> if it's fun and enjoyable, you'll want more of it. You'll desire more of it. If you want to um, harness that appetite, create a hap- appetite for the things of God, make it fun. Add fun to your faith. Do you know what? Fun doesn't diminish your faith. <laughs> you know, some people are really solemn about religion. You've got to be serious. And if you smile or if you laugh, gosh, that mustn't be, that mustn't be godly at all. <laughs> Can I tell you something? God is hilarious. He is fun. He's, the, he's generous and He's kind and he's, he's overflowing with joy. In your homes, make faith fun. My kids can't wait to get to kids' church because we have an incredible kids' program that is fun. It is godly and it is Christ-centered. But can I tell you something? It's fun. And your children and you will desire more of what you enjoy. Make it fun. You know, it's like when I... My kids don't want to eat their meal, their food, or their vegetables. So I put it on the fork and I make it a plane, and then it gets into their mouth. Does that diminish the nutritional value of what's on the fork? No, it just made them want it more. Just made them enjoy it. It helped with their appetite to long for something that is good for them. Is that being legalistic? No. (laughs) Is saying you must go to church or you must eat your vegetables, is that legalistic? No, it's important. I have three meals a day. Does that mean I'm legalistic? No, because it's important. (laughs) True? Learn to add the fun to your faith. I I heard of a family that they have popcorn prayer meetings. I just think that's the coolest idea ever. Because they wanted to encourage the family to get together more and pray together more. So they'll, they'll cook up a bowl of popcorn and they'll put it in the lounge room and they'll bring the family for popcorn prayer time. And when it's your turn to pray, you can scoop up the biggest handful of popcorn you've ever seen. And when someone else is praying, you can throw some popcorn at them. When you say amen, you can throw popcorn in the air. I don't know, I'm making this up. But they have popcorn prayer time. And they've made something that can become a religious obligation, something that can become a duty or a chore. They've made it fun. And the family's gathering together to pray with one another over popcorn. Hey, we can be creative. We can make things fun. And for our children and for the people in our world, we can say, hey, faith is good. Faith is full of joy. It's inspiring. It's encouraging. God is fun. Let's declare those words over our home that Joshua spoke over his. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah? Make God a part of your everyday conversations. Work Him in. I love talking to people that are in maybe non-Christian environments. And I love hearing the stories where they just work God into the conversation. I love it because it inspires a curiosity. Tell me more about that. Value church and make faith fun. Amen. Bless this house as we hunger and thirst for righteousness. May we be filled with the goodness of God and experience all that He has for us in Jesus' name. Would you close your eyes with me today? 
maybe you're here in this place and as I was talking about being Christ-centered, maybe you know about God or maybe you've had God on the outside but something stirred in you today saying, no, 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 I need to, I need to make Jesus my Lord and Saviour. I need to live a God-centered life, a Christ-centered life where He is, he, he directs my path, that He gives me wisdom, that He leads me and He guides me. And as we listen to the voice of God as He guides us, you can be, you can be sure that you will walk in blessing, that your life will be filled, not trouble-free, but blessed. Not without pain and sometimes some tough seasons, but incredibly blessed. If that's you and you want to say, you know what, I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Saviour. I want to choose to follow Him. While no one else is looking around, would you raise up your hand so that I could see it? We're going to say a prayer. And this prayer basically is us confessing and believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Saviour, that He died and rose again. The Bible tells us that as we do that, we are saved and we are born into the family of God. That's awesome. I see that hand. Is there anyone else here today that would say, yes, I want to pray that prayer? Awesome, I see that hand. Is there anyone else today that say, yes, pray this with me. I want to I want to follow Jesus. Follow Him wholeheartedly. Make God the centre of my life. Awesome, church. We're going to pray this prayer together. And those people that raise their hand, but even if you didn't raise your hand, I want you to say this and mean it from your heart. It goes like this. Dear God, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving my sin, for setting me free, for giving me a future and a hope. I choose to follow you and make you the centre of my life. In your name I pray. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. Come on church, let's rejoice. Rejoice with those making a decision to follow Jesus. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, I want to encourage you. After the service, there'll be people that'll be holding up Bibles and just want to pray with you and help you in that next step. But could you stand with me, church? I just want to pray before I hand it over to Pastor Bobby to close out. I just want to pray for us that God would bless our homes, yeah? That God would bless our marriages, that God would bless our children and our families and the generations to come, that God would bless the, the, the spheres of life that we find ourselves in, in our workplaces or wherever we are, study, that God would bless it in Jesus' name, that we could know that we walk in favour and blessing. Would you pray with me today? Father, we just thank You for Your hand upon us. God, we thank You that You are with us, that You go before us, God, that You make our paths straight. Father, I pray that as we become people that decide to hunger and thirst, God, that we, we develop and cultivate an appetite for the things of God, that hunger and thirst for Your righteousness. God, I pray that as we do that, we would experience great filling. Holy Spirit, that You would fill us to overflowing, that we would truly experience what it is to be satisfied and to be fulfilled. And God, I just pray that You would help us, lead us, give us wisdom and guide us. God, as we make You our first and foremost priority, as we make You the centre of our lives, God, I pray that You would help us to keep following You one step after the other as Your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that we would continue to follow You. And God, that You would lead us into places of righteousness. You would lead us into favour and blessing. God, that goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our life. Father, I thank You that as we lay down our lives, as we surrender what we have to You, God, that You promise You will fill it in Jesus' Name. So God, we just pray Your blessing over our marriages, our families, our children, our workplaces, our homes. God, I pray You bless us in Jesus' Name. We thank You that You're a good, good Father. In Your Name we pray. And every person said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.